Hey folks, today we have a fun trick for you. I'm gonna show you a couple of useful techniques to do something like this. And in this case, what I've done is I've instanced 400 rectangles, attached a movie file that I've cached on the GPU to each one and given each one an independent playhead. Now, while count MOV maybe isn't the most artistic video out there, this can be useful for a lot of different things. For example, if you have some kind of very short animation, you know, maybe it's like a butterfly flapping its wings, or maybe you have some kind of airplane going through a scene and it's got a propeller. You know, these kind of short animations are very easy to cache directly all of their frames onto the GPU, whether it's 30 frames, 60 frames, 100 frames, really just depends on how much GPU memory you have. But the nice thing is once they're cached onto the GPU, we can actually just scrub through them all independently on different instances to give a really cool, natural, big and expansive vibe. So let's take a look at building something like this. The first thing I want to do is create a grid sop. And this is going to be the basis of my instancing. So I'm going to put one movie at every point inside my grid. So I'll go ahead and create my geometry that's going to hold the object that I'm going to be instancing. And in this case, I'll go inside of it, delete the torus, create a new rectangle sop for the movie. And a nice trick I like to do, especially when I'm instancing movies and flat kind of assets, I just try and make the size of my rectangle match the aspect ratio of my movie. That way it doesn't get stretched or squeezed in any particular direction. So if I go back up a level and make a movie file in top, I can load up count.mov. And if I middle click on it, we can see it's 16.9. And in this case, we can see 1.77 to 1 is the aspect ratio. So I'm going to use this 1.77 to 1 as my X and Y size on my rectangle. So I'll say my size is 1.77 to 1. And we can already see that kind of looks like a 16.9 screen. So I'll go ahead and turn on the render and display flag. And then I'm going to go up a level and go to the instance page. I'm going to turn that on and grab my grid here and set it as the default instance op. Now I can go ahead and assign my X, Y positions on it, and my Z as well, but there's a grid, so there's no Z. So for X, I can say P0, which is position zero. For Y, I can say P1, and for Z, I can say P2. Now, if you zoom in to look at this, and I'll activate the viewer and kind of look around, it looks like just one flat plane. And this is because right now our geometry inside is member size 1.77 to 1, but the data that we're using for the actual points is a size of 1 to 1. That means we have all these points in a tight spot and all these instances basically just stacked on top of each other so it looks like one consistent sheet. So an easy way to fix this is I usually go to my point source of data here, which is my grid, and I'll just middle click on size and just start sizing it up until once we get to a big enough size here, you can see at 29 by 29, now we can see a space in between them on the vertical. And then because I know they're 69 or 1.77 to one, I can actually space them out a little bit more on the X than I will on the Y. And you can see now we essentially have our grid here of 69 little screens. So with that said, we're almost ready to kind of dive into the trick of this. And there's a couple of little tricks I want to show you along the way. So the first thing we're going to do is actually load our texture onto the GPU and then assign it as a material for these instances. Now, if you've never worked with Texture 3D Top before, very cool operator. You can almost think of it like the 3D GLSL world's version of a cache. Because what we're going to do, instead of keeping all of the frames in a sequence like a cache does, is you can almost think of it as a loaf of bread. We're going to put every frame back to back and it's going to create a 3D texture where the X and the Y, or the U and V in this case, are going to be where we are on the particular frame. And then the W is what we call the depth into that stack of frames. So it's really cool, sounds complicated, but very easy to use. So for example, we have this movie file in. If we middle click on it, we can see it has length 100. So there's 100 frames in this animation. So if I plug it into the texture 3D, immediately we're going to see these frames that are just getting saved kind of as it's running along, probably similar to how a cache top works if you use that before. 
A couple things I want to do immediately. First is set my cache size to 100 because I want to have every single frame saved for my playback so that it can loop perfectly. Now, one of the tricky things with this is I can see that all the frames are offset. So it kind of just keeps moving over time, but we can see frame one is in the middle here, two, three, four, and it kind of wraps around and loops. Not very helpful, especially if we're going to use a timer chop or a noise as our kind of playhead. We want it to be able to know that zero is the beginning and one is the end of the movie. So a really useful trick I can do is use the pre-fill option here. So I'm going to turn pre-fill on. And you're going to see once you turn pre-fill on, essentially it just fills the whole texture 3D once, and then it doesn't continue updating the frames for you. Now we can still see we have this issue of frames just kind of being out of order. Now one of the really cool tricks behind the scene with pre-fill is that if our source is somehow connected to the timeline, it's going to use that index when it does the pre-fill. I know that sounds like a little bit of voodoo, but all you got to remember is if you want to use a pre-fill, if whatever is driving your movie file in, if you have a switch top, you know, whatever is driving the input of the text 3D, if it's driven by the timeline, it's going to respect starting from zero every time you hit prefill. So an easy way to visualize that is if I go to my movie file in one, and let's say I change my play mode to be specify index instead of sequential. So now if I look at my index, we can see me.time.frame. So this is essentially a frame counter that's connected to my timeline. So just like I was saying, if I now go to the text 3D and hit prefill, what Touch Designer is going to do internally behind the scenes is see that this is driven by the timeline, restart the timeline behind the scenes, not even that you can see it, and then start caching the frames as if it's reading from frame 1 to 100 of that movie. And now you can see our frames are perfectly in order, starting from 1 in the bottom left, going all the way to 100 in the top. Now you can use that with anything, you can use it with switch tops, but movie file in tops are probably where you're going to use that the most. So that's just a nice little trick that you can keep on hand if you want to perfectly fill a texture 3D. So now with a texture 3D, what I said before is this is actually a 3D texture. This is a different format, completely different to our 2D textures that we're normally working with. Because like I said, there's a concept of depth to it when we start working with GLSL and working on the GPU where your UV coordinate is where you are on the page, and then your W coordinate becomes which of these slices that you're actually accessing the texture of. Because even though this kind of looks like a mosaic of my frames, in reality on a GPU, there's no mosaic. There's just a stack of 100 frames that we can navigate through. So I'll go ahead and put a null top on the end of this. And then I'll make a constant material, because I don't need any lighting for these movie files. So I'll go ahead and assign that on my geometry in the render parameters, take my constant one and drag and drop it on materials. And then I'm going to go to my constant material and where I have color map, I want to take the null one and drag and drop it onto that. Great. So we're really almost there because now you can see we have all of these. Let me activate the viewer here. We have all 400 of these looking at the exact same frame because even though we've given it a text 3D, we haven't given it a set of 3D coordinates to use. They're all just going to start from that same frame. So now that we want to get to coordinates, there's complicated ways you can do this, but there's also really simple ways you can do this. So for example, if I wanted to have all the playheads at the exact same time, all I need to know is that just like when you're using instancing normally and passing data into it, I'm going to need one channel with 400 samples across it, because remember, if we middle click on our SOP, we have 400 points here, so I need one playhead per instance. So I could even do something as simple as use a timer chop. And in this case, I can go to the outputs and turn off ready and done. And then on the timer parameters, I'm going to turn on cycle because I just want this to loop forever and I'm going to turn off the cycle limit. Final thing I'm going to do is I know that my movie is 100 frames, so I can go to my timer chop, go to the length, change it from seconds to frames, and set it to 100. So now I'm almost ready. What I can do is use something like a stretch chop, which allows me to take this from just being one sample and taking that one sample and just stretching it over 400 samples. 
So in my stretch, I'm going to go to unit values, change it from relative to absolute because I absolutely know I want from zero to 399, which is going to give me 400 samples. So I have my start already set at zero and my end I can set at 399. And you can see now we have a nice long sample rich channel. And if I middle click on it, we can see 400 I, which tells me 400 samples. So the final thing I have to do is put a null chop after this, go to my geometry. And then I want to go to the instance two page of the uh, parameters and down here where I have texture mode. Now you may have encountered UV coordinates before, especially if you're working in 3D, but maybe you've never encountered the W. Now, in this case, the nice thing is we are only concerned about our W because our UV coordinates that the rectangles are using perfectly matches and fits the image on it. So essentially, we just want to give it this index. So I can grab my null two here, drag and drop it onto my texture coordinate op, and then from the W channel, select timer fraction. Now, what's really cool is once I hit start on this timer, we're going to see all of these playheads start playing along, all in unison, perfectly together. Now, even this alone, before you do the cool part about offsetting and changing all of the positions of the playheads, this is a really great technique if you have a ton of the same video appearing on different places on the screen, and you need to do it some way efficiently. Because like this, if I was to take my movie file in and try and copy and paste it 50 times and hit play on all of them, it's going to become very cumbersome and very slow on the machine. Whereas like this, even on my laptop, I can essentially have 400 of the same movie playing back all over the screen. Now it seems like the timer didn't loop, so I'm just going to hit initialize and start it again. And now we can see now it's looping properly and we can see all 400 of our movies are playing back in sync. So then another cool trick I thought I'd leave you with this in the video is how to actually offset these playheads in a very easy way. So right now we've got a timer, it's getting stretched out. It's basically, we can see the same value over all 400 samples. Now, if you've used speed chop before, it's a very helpful operator because what it allows you to do is send in a value. So I'm going to make a constant chop in this case. And if I make the value going into the speed chop, for example, one, what the speed chop is going to do is count one unit every one second. Now, if I made this value 10, for example, it's going to count up faster because it's now counting 10 units every one second. So you can almost think of this as 10 FPS counter at 10. Or if you set it to 30, you can almost think of it as a 30 FPS counter that you have. Now, one of the cool things is that you can also set it to negative numbers. So for example, if I set it to negative one, it's going to count down the value that it already had within it by one unit every one second. Now, a trick you may not know about speed chop is that normally you may have seen it with, you know, one or two values from a single chop kind of going into it. So maybe something like this you saw. But that's not really going to scale well if, if we need 400 of them. So a cool thing we can do is actually pass in a multi sample channel and every single sample is going to get its own little speed counter created. So if I wanted to do this really quick and easy, I could make a noise chop go to the channel, set the end to be samples and at 399, because remember, we need 400 of these samples. Now I can plug this into the speed. Don't worry if it doesn't work at first, because we have to go to the speed and turn on speed per sample. So now what you're going to see is that every value in this noise chop that is of a value of greater than zero, is going to have a counter that's increasing in value. You can see on the left side that the, the chart is actually growing in values and all the numbers below zero are going to have negative counters that are starting with them. Now this isn't super interesting because the shape of the noise is, is still just being replicated because everything is moving consistently. So a cool trick we can do is set the limit type to be loop. And now what it's going to do is as those positive values are pushing up, they're going to push all the way up till they hit the number one. Then they're going to loop back to zero and push back up to one. And as those ever increasing numbers of the speed continue to rise, it's just going to keep looping that perfect zero to one range that we want. And the same can be said about the negative numbers, except they're playing backwards, which is really nice. So if we take this 
super easy and quickly kind of distributed random playhead, we can now pipe this into our null. And we're going to see an error because the channel name is different here. So before we had timer fraction, now we have chan1. So what I could do is just go back to my noise, change the channel name to be timer underscore fraction. And just that easily, now we have 400 random playheads all playing through the same movie 400 times at completely different rates too. So for example, we can see the values in the noise that are closer to one or negative one are going to be playing faster than the values of any of the noise samples that are closer to zero. So all of this running on the GPU, we can see my laptop is even still holding 60 FPS because that's the power of instancing and using these kind of techniques like UVW. Hey folks, thanks for watching. If you're serious about learning touch designer and getting into our interactive and immersive industry, I highly recommend you check out the Interactive and Immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can click the link in the description to learn more about that. And if you like this video, hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and click on the little bell icon for more awesome free content.